Martin Pipe saddles another winner at Cheltenham. One more victory for Britain's most successful national hunt trainer. Tonight, how Martin Pipe wins and how the horses play. Six thirty this morning at Martin Pipe's gallops in the West Country. For two months, we've been negotiating to talk to him about the speed with which he uses up horses. Yesterday, he agreed. Just before I start, I'd like to say your researchers on this Cook Republic program have been very aggressive, and we find this very upsetting. Normally, your program investigates crooks and criminals. This has been very distressing to my family and all my staff. We have nothing to hide. I didn't suggest you did, Mr. Pipe. And I also refute the allegations that our researchers have been aggressive. Because that's, that's not their way. I mean, perhaps you don't like having questions asked. Which is why, for example, you issued a, a photo fit picture, as it were, of one of those researchers. So we're very happy to have you here and answer your questions. National hunt racing is tough for man and horse alike. Martin Pipe has watched more of his winner's home than any other trainer alive. In the process, he's polarized the racing world. He's loved and loathed. Mr. Pipe on the move at Stratford Racecourse. His energy and single-minded drive for success in national hunt racing has put him amongst the record breakers the first national hunt trainer to saddle more than 200 winners in a season, and the first man to top a million pounds in prize money. The racing press is in no doubt. Pure genius, they say. Critics are worried about what they call a racehorse factory. If you're going to train to the intensity that they do, something has got to pay for it. You cannot possibly be so intense. They're not machines. They're flesh and blood and, and muscle. And, you know, they have minds like everybody else has. And the intensity of it all can blow them, blow the minds. Certainly blows the bodies. That's a stone cold certainty, you know. Uh, but this is a modern world. And if people want this type of success, sadly, it's the animals that have to pay for it. Martin Pipe's tally of winners has been said to put other trainers to shame. But this is to miss the point, according to one punter whose letter to the Racing Post first made us curious. Having studied the statistics, he concluded that his methods are incompatible with those which are likely to allow a horse anything but the briefest career. Martin Pipe's philosophy is to, or has seemed to be, to win at all costs. This is uh, uh, a chase the records, let's win at all costs and it's almost a case of never mind the quality, feel the width. Um, he's also perhaps gone beyond the boundaries of acceptable risk in racing in that he will push his horses that little bit harder and that little bit further than tradition has demanded in the past. Not that there's anything wrong in breaking with tradition. Racing may be the sport of kings and queens, but it's also a business world where Mr. Pipe has increased his edge by running his horses more often and especially more often on potentially damaging firm going than would other top trainers. With his jockey and partner, Peter Scudamore, he's also gone for a different kind of horse. I go out and buy a type of horse that I will think will win quickly for the owner. We seem to be getting it right, perhaps I'm a better judge than most. So we buy a three or four year old which we think if we teach him to jump, he will win races. Unfortunately, if he's a light-framed horse, he won't go on to win the Gold Cup. But he has plenty of other uh, places in life. But as a, as a racing performer, in your terms, he'll wear out pretty quickly. He can win races and give his owner some satisfaction and some fun. Also, the horse, isn't he entitled to win races? Quite often, the horses that come to Martin as 
the end of their three-year-old season, have been, have had that mileage, quite a lot of miles on the clock they've, they, they've got, because they've been trained really hard by trainers who have squeezed them as dry as they can out of duty to their owners, be they Arabs or whoever they be, they've got the maximum they can out of those horses on the flat. They then come to Martin, and it is his duty to get what's left out of that horse. So Martin Pipe's horses are often at risk because, as Tim Fitzgeorge Parker says, they've already got miles on the clock. And many wins are scored over firm ground in low-grade selling races where the winner must be auctioned. This auction is not for a Pipe horse, but as ever in a seller, the auction price is split between the race course and the owner. 1,800 guineas, 14. At Taunton three years ago, Garwas was sold for 1,600 guineas and was already in trouble. As the Sporting Life said the next morning, the hard ground took its toll. And as jockey Peter Scudamore said, he's just about knackered on this hard ground. Sporting Life omitted to report that the horse was so knackered, it was dead within an hour. Graham Brown bought the horse. He's more than a little annoyed, although he admits he knows more about the building game than the racing game. The course vet's report to me was that, in his opinion, it was unfair to keep the horse alive. And on humane grounds, he advised me that the horse should be shot because he was so badly broken down and his tendons were so badly ruptured that it was the only fair thing to do to him to put him down. Mr. Brown publicly admitted that he'd been a well-intentioned fool, but then heard from a trainer who claimed that the horse had run three weeks earlier and finished lame. Uh, three weeks later, I was surprised to see him run in another cellar uh, at Taunton on hard ground, and I watched him again, and he won again against very moderate opposition and pulled up uh, on three legs, two legs almost, when the bandages were removed, this time, both those legs were very enlarged, um, looking as if the horse had done damage to himself three weeks earlier. This was one of the hardest decisions I'd had to make in my life. And afterwards, I felt completely devastated, gutted, that a horse that had won and I'd bought had to be shot within an hour of that. And it was obvious to me that the horse, when sold, was not fit for sale. From what I saw um, of Gorwas's legs on the second occasion that he ran, as opposed to what, what I saw three weeks earlier on the first occasion, there's no doubt in my mind that he shouldn't have run on the second occasion. Mr. Brown complained to the jockey club, and they told him to pay up or be banned. But had the horse been pushed too far? Both Mr. Pipe and jockey Peter Scudamore deny they would ever compete with a lame horse and Mr. Scudamore sprang to his partner's defence. I mean, he's been accused of doping, he's been accused of blood doping, he's been accused of whatever you, you like. He has a secret. It's out there. It is his gallop. He's the best gallop in the country. He's got wonderful facilities. He's a very intelligent man that channels that intelligence in the pursuit of excellence. And Fiona Campbell expected excellence. She sent her gelding Cativo to Mr. Pipe's yard. On Easter Monday two years ago, the horse was in the lead at Hereford. He broke down. I brought him home and we unbandaged him and his leg had slight wet marks down the back of the tendon, um, which would indicate very bad bandaging. And every day, it got worse and worse, and he had these huge wounds. I mean, they're, they're that big, uh, of, of rotting flesh, and you're pulling leg away as you remove the bandages. And you're seeing this poor little creature suffer and get thinner and thinner. The horse had to be destroyed. Mr. Pipe still claims it was fit when it left his care. The independent vet who tried to save it says it was not. I think the long-term well-being of the horse isn't a paramount consideration. What makes you say that? I think that particular yard just likes notching up winners at any cost. Go Ranger to the swimming pool, please. 
Boat ranger swimming. Martin Pipe declined to let us film his high-tech facilities. But there's no doubt about his scientific approach with up to 150 horses in training. This horse, Bow Ranger, is now dead. But to be fair, he was put down after the kind of racing accident which could befall any horse. Indeed, a race course vet who's critical of Martin Pipe was himself kicked in the jaw by a horse recently. Well, his horses run very frequently. Um, they run, some of them, two or three times, sometimes two or three times a week, and certainly several times a month. And some of his horses will run 10, 12, 14 times in a season, whereas many other trainers would find four, five, six times. Um, that would be the horse's career for that season. But he also runs them in conditions that a lot of other trainers are loath to run them. He'll run them in small tracks at the beginning of the season, in July and August, when the ground's pretty firm. And then again, at the end of the season, if they're still going, in May or June. Um, and a lot of races he picks up then or with very small fields, simply because the other trainers won't risk horses on that sort of ground. Not all vets agree. Equine vets at Bristol University heard about this program and asked us to say that Mr. Pipe's training methods are appropriate and that the results speak for themselves. Certainly, he provides a service for his owners that want winners. Um, I won't say at any cost, but that's a phrase that might spring to mind. Um, and at the end of the day, we've got to probably say that the abuse of horses from this sort of methods is, isn't really justified. So you would call it abuse? I think I would, yes, yeah. Mr. Pipe's supporters point to his ability to bring back horses after injury. Horses like Omerta, here winning the Irish Grand National. But such comebacks are relatively short-lived and therefore count amongst the wastage figures. I find them appalling, quite honestly. And, of course, the horses are overworked, probably overtrained, and overrun, and will sustain injuries. And these injuries are normally tendon injuries, which take a very long time to heal. But Mr. Pipe has very modern facilities and obviously feels he can get his horses fit again very quickly. I mean, is there a magic cure for tendon injuries? There is no magic cure for tendon injuries. They take months to heal. And they must then be retrained very gently. Racing lives on statistics, from handicapping to betting. But wastage is the one thing nobody seems to have bothered to calculate. Not the tally of winners, but the effect of racing on the horse, in terms of the length of its career and on occasion its life. Our calculations for five leading trainers show how many horses were in training last year and not this. Lowest was Jenny Pittman with a wastage rate of 31%. Three out of 10 did not return the next year, seven did. The average for the four trainers, excluding Martin Pipe, a wastage rate of 37%. Four out of ten horses didn't return the next season. Mr. Pipe's wastage rate was the highest at 70%. Seven out of ten horses did not return. And this horse symbolizes the argument over wastage. Red Rum at the grand old age of 26. He's won the Grand National three times. The first was in 1973. His trainer, now his owner, is Ginger McCain. Would he have stood this modern type of preparation and the type, we're talking about this commercial operation, basically, there is no question at all he would not have stood that. I can quite definitely say he would never have been the horse he was, he became. He would have been worn out, burnt out, call it what you wish, by the time he was a three-year-old. The Dickinson family once saddled the first five home at the Cheltenham Gold Cup, the kind of record they say pipe horses could never match. They don't seem to last all that long. I mean, say he has, he, he must be a very good trainer. He brings these horses out and, and he, he can win seven or eight or nine races uh, with these horses. But do you see them another year? No, probably not. Martin Pipe has never won the National or the Gold Cup. 
Jenny Pittman has won both. Some people may think that horses are machines and that you pull in at a garage and fill them up with high octane fuel and that's it, they're ready then to go. I don't actually look, them like, look at them like that. They're, they're flesh and blood the same as we are. But Red Run wins after one of the most thrilling finishes in the history of the National. And the blistering pace over the race broke all records. I don't think I want a Martin Pike horse, not once he's had it. No, I don't. They say that your methods are too radical, too stressful on the horse for its long-term future, that you produce good results short-term and don't produce good resu results long-term. How many horses, for example, have you still got in your yard from 1986? You, you have done all the figures, you would know. You haven't got any now, have you? I haven't got any. I don't know. You would know. Of course I have. must have some. Well, the last one, know. the last one broke down uh, a little while ago. You tell so me there the are, figures. There are, none, there are none left from 1986. I must have some figures from 1986. How do you feel, Mr. Pike, when a horse does break down? It's very distressing when this happens. Unfortunately, you do get injuries. Um, athletes get injured. It is distressing to myself and all my staff. We do worry about it. This is why we get the horse fit in the first place. John Evans bought an ex-pipe horse. Figano was once sold for over £200,000, but was well on the way downhill when he last ran at the end of March in a selling race at Southall. If he won, he had to be auctioned under the race rules. Figano clear by six to eight, jumps it well, gets away from it well. He won. Figano scoots home. John Evans found Vigano could barely walk when he got him home. His trainer called in the vet. If you stand directly behind the horse, the large muscle mass of that left hind back leg is atrophied. In other words, it's smaller than the right hand leg. And that suggests to me that there's been a chronic high leg lameness in that leg for quite some time. Whether he's got a, a condition which is curable is doubtful. That, that hasn't happened in two days. That's happened in quite a long period, you know, quite a long period. Mr. Pipe insists the horse was sound, but the vet told us the horse had a long-standing injury, shouldn't have been raced, and may be beyond help. I spoke to Mr. Pipe, he told me that there was nothing wrong with that horse, but it likes to swim, which was said a little bit funny to me. And I would say that Mr. Pipe knew there was a problem with that horse. That's his why he probably put it in that claiming race. That's sorry, that selling race, to pass it on to somebody like myself. Tim Watts, unlike Mr. Evans, is an experienced owner. He's come to see Pertemp's network, one of six horses he took away from Martin Pipe. Mr. Pipe runs a, a horse factory. I don't think it'd be wrong to call it that. Mr. Pipe is in racing purely for Mr. Pipe and not necessarily for the owners or the horses, in our opinion. Bill Turner also took a couple of horses away from the Pipe stable. Both gave him and owner Don Short cause for concern. One of them was called Star of Kuwait, the other Casca. They came straight from Mr. Pipe's yard. They were picked up by the owner and they were brought straight to our yard. They were in a very a poor condition, the ribs sticking out, the hip bones sticking out. Um, Star of Kuwait had a great big lump on her backside. Terrible mess that was in. Um, they just generally looked very down and out. Owner Bob Short called for a vet's report. It said the horses were in poorish condition. Mr. Pipe's vet said this was without foundation, a position Mr. Pipe still maintains. The owner, however, commissioned a further report, which said both horses were in poor condition due to neglect. You've got to respect a man's results. He's done things that no other trainer could possibly dream of doing. But those horses, I may be stumped for saying it, but those horses, they were not capable of racing, in my opinion. Our final wastage statistics, prepared from the authoritative Horses in Training by an expert statistician, went further than one year to see if there was a pattern over five years. And there was. Rival trainers don't return four horses out of ten. 
Mr. Pipe's wastage rate is seven horses out of ten. By no means all his horses end up damaged or dead, though we've found more examples than we've room to show you. But then Mr. Pipe says you can't compare his horses with anyone else's. It's a different type of horse. One has to lay out more money to buy the type of horse to win the Gold Cup. We can't afford to buy that type of horse. Uh, we haven't got owners that will pay for a horse a fortune, run it twice perhaps, give it a couple of runs for education, run it again the next year over hurdles, then again over fences, then perhaps miss a year and come back and perhaps win a Gold Cup or something like that. That costs a fortune to do that. So are, you, are you saying I should do that with my four-year-olds? I should give them three runs and say, we'll keep you to next season. Don't forget, these horses belong to the owners, and the owners um, pay the bills. So it's economic pressure that keeps them racing the way they do. The owners want to run their horses. Those type of owners that want to win the Gold Cup, they will wait and wait for dreams. Well, we don't have fools that dream. Yours is a more business-like approach, or your owner's approach is more business-like. Just because we get more winners, I think we're professional. Ours is a professional approach. As opposed to what approach with other trainers, then? I think we've taken all the guesswork out of training. We have the kindest gallops in England. They are the best gallops. They might not be the longest, they're the kindest gallops. It's like galloping on a carpet. The horses love it, there's no risk to injury. We weigh our horses. We don't guess how heavy they are. We don't say, that horse is 10 kilos overweight. We have facts. Um, we take blood tests. We monitor their, their pictures. We take temperatures twice a day. If a horse has a temperature, should you run the horse? We, I believe, do it the professional way. We take the guesswork out of training. And as a result, you bring back, in the following season, one horse in four, and others who use other methods bring back many more horses. It's easy to bring back horses. What do you want to bring back horses for? Well, what is the point you're getting at? Well, the suggestion made by others is that your method, high-tech though it is, actually burns the horses out. They keep winning, so they cannot be under stress, and they must be enjoying it. Surely if they win the races, they're enjoying it. But they only Don't keep you... winning for a short period of time, is the point that other people make. What is a short period of time? Well, they, 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 they don't return quite often uh, the next year. How relevant is that? But to racing aficionados like Roy David, it's absolutely relevant to the welfare of the very animals on which this business is based. So why has there been no public discussion of wastage? I think this is because the jockey club have either looked at these figures and decided to sweep the whole thing under the carpet, or that they haven't looked at these figures and that they uh, have not seen that these figures are damaging the sport. If there's an unacceptable risk and a high turnover of horses, that's surely not good for the sport. And they should take this whole matter seriously and examine them and come up with some sort of uh, guidance on whether this is the correct way the sport is going in the future. The sporting press has said this program was not in the interests of racing. It was made in the interests of horses.